On November 16, 2017, the Enforcement Committee adopted the Executive Director's recommended enforcement decision, including a proposed cease and desist and civil penalty order. As amended at the hearing following staff's withdrawal of the proposed penalty for one violation, and that was subject to potential modifications of the proposed order by mutual agreement of the parties. It's clear to us that the parties have not been able to agree on this, at which point we on the commission believe this item then goes, on the enforcement committee, believes it then goes up to um, the commission. So on the advice of counsel, we're not going to hold a hearing. This item goes directly up to um, the commission, and our recommendation stands as to what we made the recommendation last time, which was on the previous enforcement order, and so we're recommending to the full commission that they enforce the, um, the original enforcement decision. Thank you for all coming. So how do you do that without public comment? Yeah. There is no hearing, so there is no public comment. We can't it today. People have jobs. So that's what we're doing. And so we're now on to the next item. Rubber stamping. Rubber stamping. Rubber stamping. Misuse and abuse. Jokes. Why don't you address the issue? Sure, why don't you clarify? Wow. We're voting citizens. This is, sorry, for clarification, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, the committee is standing on its order that it um, made in at the November 2018 hearing. And that is, if the parties could not reach an agreement, then the committee was recommending, would rec that the committee's order was that the it was recommending to the full commission that it adopt the recommended enforcement decision in November with the one modification. Then why is that a public hearing? hearing? Why did you do a schedule of public hearing? Why are we at a public hearing if it's not a hearing? It's why not a public hearing. It's quite total disarray. So I think the answer is on the, is that we so, so. receive this. We have to view. There's actually, if I recall, there are actually objections to the public hearing from Mr. Sanders as well. Um, what? <coughs> so, no, 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 no. so anyway, that is our. No, not anyway. There is no. The, the, the public don't. challenges the jurisdiction. Um, jurisdiction once challenged can so be you're out of order. and must be decided. Main versus Thibault. 100 SCT 25019P record. So the other thing I wanted to say is there will be opportunity for public comment at the full public at the full commission here. And when is that? So they have to be agendized. Um, I'm not sure when that would be. Okay, so. And in the meantime, we are where we are. The, the enforcement so the decision has not been, has not been approved by the full commission. Are you interested in what we have to say? So, next we have the report. Uh, are you interested in what we have to say? Obviously not. So next we have... Not really. Sure. Right. We're paying for you to be here. We're taxpayers. Okay, excuse this is our me. dollar that you're wasting. Excuse me. I will not. We, we are very interested in what you have to say. That's why you're showing which, us up. Which is why we want you to say it before the full commission. Because this body is passing yes. the recommended decision from November to the full commission, which is going to take public testimony and have a vote on it. We are not voting on anything today. So why did you call this hearing today? So we take off work to come here, and, and now you're canceling it? People have kids and responsibilities. We have, we have a pet family, and we're we here to present. It doesn't sound like very compassionate for the close meeting, but that's the board is producing. You said it was uh, subject to the article yes, in the. Uh, so we need to move on to the report of the chief officer. officer. You didn't say whether or not it was subject to paragraph one or paragraph two. Which paragraph was the close session of the vote on? Paragraph one or paragraph two? Report of the chief. 3,000 signatures on move.org. Was it, was it paragraph Over one or paragraph two? Over 3,000. Many of them are voters who voted you into office, ladies and gentlemen. For clarification, Robert. go ahead. Was it subject to paragraph one or paragraph two of the Bagley Act? You're out of order, sir. To You're just simply out of order. 
Um, meeting time. No, we're not. What's the subject of the paragraph? Are you unable to answer the question or just enough to do so? Maybe could staff answer the question? The, the, your attorney should answer that question. Or do we get, I don't hey, know. I'll provide clarification or this for clarification. The, the committee um, understanding based on its November order was that there were two paths for the parties. This was the committee's order. The parties were either to reach an agreement and that would become the committee's recommended decision to the full commission or two if the parties didn't reach an agreement the committee's recommendation to the full commission was staff's recommended enforcement order presented to them in november with one modification made at that decision so this agenda was set out in error so you didn't schedule a meeting. Can I make a comment just to, again to try to clarify for the public? Why, are we Why would you have us Why, come yeah. here if we can't speak? We can Is speak. this America or what? We can speak in general Why are we comments here? at the beginning of the session for anything that is not in front of the commission. This is no longer in front of the commission. We could be speaking our comments right now. It's my understanding. Yes. You shut us off at the beginning by not telling us at the beginning that we were not going to be talking about West Bay Harbor CEO 2018-01. When you accepted the but, card, you, that's a contract. It did not alter the agenda. You do not alter the agenda. Either we get to speak or we're glad to hear very mad. <laughs> <laughs> I think that you have the discretion whether you want to let like this well, speak. Really well, <laughs> yes, oh, yeah. yes, two more like There's mayors in there. I think we the agenda as is. Did not alter the agenda. No, the the agenda. No motion to alter the agenda. There was no motion to alter the agenda. Exactly. You are violating state law. Is Governor Brown aware of these types of proceedings? Did not alter? agenda. You did not motion. When you accepted our cards, process. that's a contract. to speak. If you weren't going to let us speak, you shouldn't have accepted our cards. You accepted the agenda. You did not make a motion to alter the agenda. You must follow the agenda according to the law. Well, no, the minds are already made up. It doesn't matter what we say. Well, well I'd like to still have my voice on record. They don't go forward. Nobody ever agrees with me anyway, but <laughs> <laughs> I didn't come all the way from Santa Cruz in Redwood City. It was important enough for me to come here. I think it's important enough for me to speak. You can always plug your ears. I just think our voted officials need to understand what's going on. Robert's rules of order. You accepted the agenda. You did not make a motion. The agenda moves forward as is. That is the law. <laughs> 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 How come the camera is not rolling when we're being shut off? Yeah, the camera should be rolling. Let's yeah, that's camera. true. That's a violation it's of the law as well. It's supposed to be part of public residence. Right? That's a violation of the law without the camera on. The meeting is in session. The camera should be on. Yeah. It is on. This one's on. Oh, this one's on. Okay, good. Well, stand behind it. Make a look. Can you go like this? Where's there? This is recorded. Thanks. And the fact that they're not recording on the video. This is 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 not recording on the video. This
people and walk the agenda. Right. He did not make Only a motion to alter the agenda. Have, have somebody make a motion to amend the agenda. agenda. The, the law. Then vote on it. And then I would not know why he would do that. He's the man who's all over. You would expect a higher level of decision. Somebody the only one. Yeah, the decision's out. The lady who's the mayor of Alameda. It's not legal. It's not legal. They're officer violating comment. Yeah, and the guy. The lawyer from Tesla, I wouldn't trust as far as I could throw a pencil. They were using Tesla. I don't know who the lady is. Um, because she was here before. Yes, and then she came out to the audience. And now she's back up there, so I don't have any idea. My my advice to the committee would be um, that you allow the parties to speak and allow the members of the public to, to speak uh, with respect to this item. So in terms of we're not holding the hearing because on advice of counsel you've suggested to us that you think it would, that we should stick with our original order and that it goes, should go up to the commission. So can we hear why, please, directly from the lawyer? So I have no problems listening to hearing from the public. I'm a little confused as to when we talk about the public, when we talk about the parties. I mean, are we, what are you thinking? I'm thinking since this matter was uh, agendized, um, we need to hear from the, the, the parties. Uh, and uh, members from the public, uh, based on your opening comments, that uh, the committee believes that um, its enforcement decision that it held in November um, did not contemplate that there would be uh, this hearing today, that it would be going to the commission. To ask for clarification, are you recommending that the committee uh, hold a public hearing in light of the intention of the committee for how to proceed or otherwise hear from the public? Uh, I think, uh, well, yeah. All right, then we, should, then we should hear from the parties first. Um, so there's a number of objections from um, West Point Harbor. Mr. Sanders, attorney, you want to speak to him? Uh, Mr. Chair, if I might, just do a time check. There's a BCDC commission meeting scheduled in this room at 1 o'clock. Oh, oh, we have to delay oh, since oh, you delayed our comments. I'm sure there's another room. So I just wanted to. So I, I'm thinking about the time check as well. Um, <laughs> and I want to give the public the opportunity to speak. So <laughs> if you want to just make a speech for maybe five minutes. Oh. And then I think what we'll end up doing it's is, I think what we'll end up doing is some um, continuing this process. It's not wasted 20 minutes. We can make this. You other can always do your jobs. Work. Just they say. Can see, they can so, uh, Chairman Sharp, if, I'm, if I may, um, obviously we're here in a very unusual circumstance. The staff, Mr. Zepatello, will have a proposed order that they presented to you put on the agenda. Was so, let's be clear, we did not put it on the agenda. Staff put it on the agenda and you objected it to being on the agenda. I, I believe that's what I said. Right. So and the and so, uh, I'm happy for Mr. Zepatello to take a few minutes, as he and I talked about, to make his presentation about why the proposed modified order is the appropriate way to proceed, and I'm happy to respond to that. On the other hand, I thought I heard uh, you say, we're not having a hearing. So I certainly don't want to waste the public's time if we're not having a hearing and having two lawyers argue about something that's really not before you. I'm very happy to cede my time to have members of the public address their comments and concerns to you. All right. So I, I think this is... I think this is... So when I read your objections, your objections were to have this hearing, frankly, and that you... I thought you indicated that you did not think that we should hold a hearing on this, that we should, in fact, go up to the commission because that's what our order was. No, no. no. That, that our position was, and we made several objections to the proposed modified order, 
we, we did not object to having a hearing. Uh, Mr. Sanders has incurred incredible time and expense. The lawyers, others have been here to come to this hearing. So we did not object to there being a hearing. What we have objected to on a number of grounds is the proposed modified order. I, I'm now understanding that based on the advice of counsel, that the proposed modified order is moot, that you're not going to take it up. You're going to recommend the order from back in November. And if that is true, and maybe we misspoke, maybe if that is, if that is we're just going to send this up to the commission, when, what would be the purpose of discussing the proposed order and going over the different issues? And you're back to where I was. It's their proposal. If they want to speak to it, I'm happy to respond or better use of time that's ticking away, let the members of the public address their comments and concerns. I'm not interested in arguing about an order that you have just now said you're not going to take up. That, that would be a waste of everyone's time. But if they're not going to take up the order, they've already made a decision. There was a public hearing and it was closed. In November. Well, that's what happened. We had the public hearing. We had it in November. That was our thinking on this. And I'm glad we're having this discussion because there's so much confusion. We had a public hearing. We had an order. Staff has come forward asking us to come up with a modified order. We believe that should go to the commission and that the commission should decide whether or not they want to accept the original order we made, whether or not they want to refer it to staff, whether or not they want to hold a no vote hearing. It becomes a commission decision. So it seemed silly for us to hold a hearing when we did not think procedurally we should be entertaining staff's notion of coming back and reopening the, the hearing on this. It, it's certainly... Uh, and that's what your brief argued. That's at least the way I understood it. Uh, what we argued is that the proposed modified order was defective in a number of respects. But also that they had no discretion to hear it because they already made a decision and we didn't agree to modify it. And, and so back to what uh, Mr. Alderson said, if, if this committee is willing to hear from the public, then I'm about three minutes past sitting down and letting members of the public address right. their comments. Is there any problem with me hearing from the public, Mr. Zepton? I mean, I agree that we've had this hearing already that, you know, that's why I'm in a little procedural. So we had this hearing in November. The public spoke in November. You object as a threshold, and it's in your brief, as a threshold issue of whether or not we should entertain hearing a modified order. And we agree with you, basically, that we think it should go up to the commission. Understood. So I'm happy to hear from the public because you came today, but I just want to make sure there's no objections to that or, or concerns. Can I ask counsel for uh, advice? Uh, can we proceed as follows? Uh, uh, open a public hearing on the uh, modified uh, recommended enforcement decision. Briefly hear from staff as to the basis for presenting that. What we've read uh, council's briefs and arguments about why it would be, in their view, inappropriate to consider that now. We can hear from members of the public who have taken time out of their day to attend uh, on the issues that are presented, and then the committee I can close the public hearing and make a decision as to how to proceed with the uh, modified uh, proposed enforcement decision. We've expressed our intent already to uh, as to how to proceed. Yes. Okay. Mr. Zapatella, anything further? Do you mind check, start calling or, the public? Can I, uh, or could we um, make the decision we made that, that we're going to forward the original decision to the commission and revisit the general public comment section, um, noting that we did not, um, at that point when we were at the general public comment, that this item was still on the agenda. Um, now that we have um, moved it off the agenda, we could go back to there, to that public comment and hear from the public. My advice would be to do the um, what had been previously expressed. That would be the safest route. Okay, so we're opening the public hearing then. That's the three, two, three, three. Did, did you want to say anything? Um, 
it's not clear to me exactly what the subject of the public hearing is. If it's the modified order, then I would suggest that the, te the comments should be focused on the modifications. Um, but I expect that, it, well, it sounds like we're, we're, I guess I have no objections. The public is here for the sake of process. If you want to listen to further comments or have further comments be part of the record, um, that's fine. <coughs> Mr. Subtell, it would be helpful if you could provide briefly, also for members of the public, the context for why staff was proposing the modification and why there was a proposal to put this on the agenda. Uh, and then we can at least, uh, receive the comments from members of the public on the proposed modifications, and then the committee can decide how to proceed. Okay, so I will give an abbreviated discussion here. As has already been said, we, you held a hearing in, on November 16th. You adopted a decision, a recommended order. You provided that it could be potentially modified if the parties met and agreed to modifications, particularly with respect to the cease and desist provisions of the proposed order. The parties had a number of conversations. Council did. Those settlement discussions are confidential, so I'm not going to talk about those the substance, but. As a result of that, staff reevaluated a number of issues and decided to um, suggest a modified order. As an example, and, and I'm not necessarily going to go through this in the order I intended, but the, the committee proposed that Mr. Sanders be entitled to a waiver of 50% of the penalty if he complied with the order, but it was contingent on the parties reaching an agreement. Well, the parties did not reach an agreement, but we thought we would recommend and revise the proposed order to build in the provision for a 50% waiver, even though there's no agreement, and leave it, present that for your consideration as a, as a recommendation that the um, order allow for that, to provide an incentive for compliance. As a few other examples, um, there are a couple of uh, structures in a dedicated public access area south of the parking lot, a, a garden, enclosed garden, and a wooden storage shed. The original order, would have required those items to be removed within 30 days. Instead, we, in the revised order, we suggest that Mr. Sanders be allowed to request a permit amendment to keep those structures in place um, and present that to the commission for consideration. Um, and even if those, if the proper location is not there, that would give us time to talk with Mr. Sanders about an alternative location, but wouldn't require those, those uses to be removed within 30 days. Uh, as another example, the, uh, the issue of buoys in the slough that the permit requires, both with respect to a, a no-wake zone and Greco Island, um, and warning voters to keep away from Greco Island, the original order required that those, um, that Mr. Sanders put the buoys up within 30 days. Well, Mr. Sanders claims that that can't be done, so in the revised order, we built in a provision that said, he, he shall apply to the Coast Guard or anybody else, any other agency, to put those buoys in within 30 days. And if, in the end, the Coast Guard or other agencies, it can't be done, that he shall consult with BCDC and the Coast Guard and those agencies and come up with an alternative and then apply to a permit amendment, apply for a permit amendment that would allow uh, that to happen. So, again, we are building in some flexibility and some um, an opportunity to do to, to not make this such a, an inflexible order as an example on that issue. Uh, let me just look through my notes and see if there's... Oh, another example. Um, there are pathways around the Marina Basin and in, they are required by the permit to be 12 to 15 feet wide. Mr. Sanders has claimed it's physically impossible. The, the, the most, for the most part, these pathways are 10 feet wide. While staff doesn't agree that it would be impossible, to widen these pathways, we have proposed in the revised order that he be allowed to keep the pathways at 10 to 12 feet and apply for a permit amendment to the commission that would authorize him to keep those uh, pathways at 10 to 12 feet. So again, we, whereas the original order said, submit plans and, and rebuild the pathways to 12 feet. Thank you, Mr. I guess I, I, I want to raise uh, just one, one maybe other point, um, and, and it, 
it ties in with the, um, this issue of the penalty waiver. We also modified the dates from the original order. There, there were, were to be periodic monthly status reports provided by Mr. Sanders, and then the matter would come back to this committee uh, on two occasions for the committee to gauge pro progress. And um, unlike what you heard from today on, on Scott's, the standard in, the, in this proposed order would be substantial compliance. If he substantially complies, and rather than giving the discretion to the executive director on the penalty waiver, it gives it to the commission, or to this committee rather, um, and ultimately to the commission. So we were building in um, an opportunity for uh, working together and for oversight by this committee uh, for purposes of compliance. Um, I guess I, I will, um, that, that highlights the key changes. I would want to report back to the committee because I think it's important and it relates to what you heard in a way from on the Scots matter. Since we were here in November, there has been no movement at all by Mr. Sanders in terms of recognizing his obligations or starting in any proactive way to address any of the compliance <laughs> issues. A signage plan, a landscaping plan, dealing with these the buoys. There's no working with staff, despite what was said before. We've got a continuing non-compliance, uncooperative, Many of the comment letters say BCDC staff is being unreasonable and you should be working with Mr. Sanders. It takes two to work together and there's, you know, we appear to be on the litigation path that was threatened and we could talk more about that, but I'll, I'll stop. Uh, that summarizes the, the changes from the order, the original order. Okay, so I guess I'm going to have to. Would you like to? I wanted to go to the public, but I saw you get up and... Well, thank you, uh, because I, I do need to respond very briefly. One of the objections that we raised to this proposed new order is it was clearly based on matters outside the record, and everyone who knows anything about administrative law knows you cannot base a proper legal order on matters outside the record. All of this stuff that we just heard from Mr. Zepatello about cooperation, lack of cooperation, no movement, that's not evidence, it's all outside the record. And that just highlights one of the critical objections we had to this proposed new order. The last thing I will draw your attention to, because you're right, we're headed to court, and that was pretty clear. There are changes that were proposed in this modified order that didn't have anything to do with pathways, didn't have anything to do with storage sheds. But it went to the issue that I talked to you about at the last hearing, which is you're being asked to sign or recommend an order, finding that all of these things caused harm and damage to the environment. And you recall I said over and over again, they have not brought you evidence of any harm or any damage. And one of the changes they made in more than one place in this proposed new order was to change the finding that harm and damage had occurred, and now to say, well, it likely occurred. And I submit to you that simply reinforces the point we made before, which is you don't have evidence, not for this proposed new order or the old order, of harm or damage to the environment. If somebody comes up to you and says, let me tell you, this happened, well, wait a minute. Actually, it's just likely that it happened. I don't play poker too often, but that's a tell. It's telegraphing there isn't the evidence in this record for the order you're going to send out for harm to the environment. And that's all I have to say. It, so it's Mr. Carr, is that? I'm Kevin Sadler. You're Kevin Sadler. So Mr. Sadler, a couple questions since we've now seen the time. How would you like to proceed on this um, if you had your druthers? Um, you've asked, clearly they're suggesting things that are all beneficial to your client for the most part when I read the, the changes in the proposed order. Um, you've indicated that those changes you object to, and maybe that's why we thought maybe we should just go straight to the full commission because you're objecting to the hearing. But that's why, because you basically are making the argument that you don't believe that that's within the record. So there's several things we could do. We could hold another hearing. We could have staff put 
and give you an opportunity to put all the stuff into the hearing. I mean, it, it's a little weird to me that staff is proposing stuff that benefits your client. The order is becoming better for your client, and yet you're opposing it. That's the way it seems. And so I'm really asking for a procedural point of view, what would give your client the best possible opportunity here to change the record, to amend it? And then we could consider maybe that order. I mean, that might be a possibility. I mean, or we could go up to the question, what would you recommend? How would you like to approach this from your client's perspective? Thank you for that opportunity, and I'll answer it in two parts. What we want is a procedural, lawful order. And we made clear that this proposed new order does not meet that standard in a number of different respects. I hear what you're saying, and I anticipated it was going to be part of his lengthy opening. That, oh, look at all these changes in this modified order. They're, they're helpful to you. They're helpful to you. But to me, as I read all the changes, not just the ones that were highlighted, because what I spoke about a moment ago, changing it to likely occurred, you go on the website and look at their proposed order, those changes aren't highlighted. I found those by reading it line by line. No, sir. We are not asking that the record be changed. And we are not agreeing, we are not acquiescing in any way to change the legal standard on the fly. The proposed order that was discussed in November, the one that I've heard you say should go up to the commission, contains a finding stated several times. There has been harm to the environment, damage to the environment. They wanted to water it down, not to help us, but to make it look better in court. And we don't agree that you can do that. And so what we want is a proper procedural order that we can then go on down the road and deal with at the commission and then in court. That's what we want. And that's why we have raised these objections to this proposed modifier. So we're proceeding along the way that you want to proceed then, which is we take that order to the commission. Understood. But I mean, that's, that's what you asked for. Is that, is that correct? I mean, you're, you're not asking us to reopen this, to, to have another hearing on this, to move forward. You're asking that this, the original order that we had in November 16th, go to the commission, go to the full commission. And, and my response is, that's exactly right, because you have two orders that have been presented to you, the one in November and the one just now. We raised all kinds of objections to the original one. We stand on those. Those are going to be litigated. We're not re-arguing that here. The new order came in. We objected to that on a number of grounds. What I hear you saying is, this body is not going to take up that modified order. The original order is going to go up to the commission. Okay. I just want to make sure you thought that was procedurally appropriate. I, I, I do. I, I don't think we should reopen this hearing for more evidence, more lawyer argument. If this committee is not going to take up the new proposed order, then once again, I think we should sit down and let the members of the public be heard. Okay. Because you have no object. The next one, you have no objection to members of the public speaking. No. All right. I want to make sure. <coughs> All right. You each have. Um, we are going to end this a little bit later. You each have one day. So our first speaker is Maureen O'Connor. Where Berkeley? Oh, Maureen O'Connor is Sanders. Sorry. To be followed by Kenneth Parker. Yes, and the comment should be to. For the committee decision. I urge you to dismiss this case, but I also want to tell you something you probably haven't heard about. In April last year, Mark applied for a BCDC permit amendment to authorize maintenance dredging at West Point Harbor. It is specified in his BCDC permit every 10 years. Maintenance dredging entails removing sediment that is built up below the docks that will cause the docks to buckle and break. To get the maintenance dredging done, Mark applied for authorization from all appropriate agencies, the DMMO process. In late November, after this committee's last meeting on the case, staff, Mr. McRae, sent a letter to Mark saying that BCDC would not authorize the maintenance dredging after all. 
This was after all the agencies, including the BCDC rep, had given verbal approval. Mr. McRae asserted that a new EIR under CEQA had to be done, that Redwood City hadn't done a proper one 15 years ago, and that he would be appointing BCDC as the lead agency. But CEQA contains a clear exception for maintenance dredging. He was aware of that. He was made aware of it by West Point Harbor and the dredging company and all the other agencies involved verified that the exception does apply. It looks to me like BCDC staff is slowing, delaying, maybe preventing maintenance dredging to punish Mark for exercising his rights in this case. It's abuse of this agency's power. It's harassment. It's Thank vindictive. You. And it directly harms the harbor. <laughs> followed by Jingli Wong, and if we could come up a little earlier so we can move through it faster. Hi there, my name's Kenneth Parker. Um, I've been a boater most of my life. I, uh, this, I, I need to say this though, I, I hate hearing people referred to as staff. They're people, they're human beings. We're all human beings. And I'm sure as humans, they're, they're working hard, they do the best they can, but people make mistakes. And among them, are some of the allegations against West Point Harbor. For example, having finally com completed all of the permit process, they opened the boat ramp in the fall of 2017, and yet West Point is being fined for six years before the thing was opened. How do you find somebody for something that wasn't even open yet, that wasn't constructed, that wasn't finished? So the, the question becomes, <laughs> along the line, staff, those people get overworked, they make mistakes. Sometimes it's mistakes. It's not a personal attack on, the, on these people. We're all like that. We're all people. We all make mistakes. I think they've made some mistakes. I think they need to be addressed and corrected. And I think, honestly, that's your responsibility to help them. Thank you. Jing Li Wang, to be followed by Bob Wilson. Good morning. Uh, I'm Jing Ling Wang. I'm a life science consultant. About 13 years ago, I would work in a biotech company in the Pacific Shore Center. And the place where the West Harbor is sitting now was a lifeless, toxic, muddy pond. Thanks to Mark Sander, who transformed that ugly, toxic land into a beautiful marina we all enjoyed. These days, I saw my former co-workers uh, take a straw in the middle of the, the day and uh, really enjoy this beautiful place. Thank you, Mark, and your <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Bob Wilson be followed by Doug Furman. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bob Wilson, and I've sailed and worked with, alongside Mr. Sanders for over 35 years. He has the highest integrity. He's a good man. I want to give you just one quick example of how ridiculous some of these attacks are by the staff, and they are attacks, make no mistake about it. My dad was a policeman, my grandfather was a fireman, and so I'm particularly offended and alarmed by the actions of the staff. This is a picture of the Redwood City Fireboat. It's called the Sequoia Guardian, Guardian's key there. The Scapoya and the Redwood City Police Boat are in fact stationed at West Point Harbor right now. They're ready to serve our community 24 by 7 today, every day, and every night. However, on page 19 of the staff's unfounded misguided <coughs> order, it claims that Mr. Sanders must amend his permit to authorize Redwood City's police and fire boats to use the guest docks or any other docks. You know, that's ridiculous. The staff order claims that our brave police and firefighters can't use the marina without their permission and without their permit. Why are they against our public safety? The police and fire boats at West Point Harbor, Harbor pay slip fees, just like everybody there. Why is the staff targeting them, and by extension our community, and by extension endangering the public safety of our community? Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, Doug Furman, you're followed by Michelle. <laughs> Members of the Enforcement Committee. My name is Doug Furman. 
Much has been made by the BCDC staff of Mark Sanders not signing Amendment Number 5 to the permit. I was at the meeting held on August 21st, 2013. The purpose of that meeting, along with a number of previous meetings, was to correct a badly written permit fraught with errors and are the basis for most of the alleged violations. Brad McRae was the chief spokesperson for BCDC and had agreed to correct 44 major conflicts in the permit. That was Amendment Number 5. Both West Point Harbor and your staff spent many hours writing the amendment to resolve the issues now before you. At the meeting I attended, Adrian Klein flatly stated that regardless of any changes to a poorly written permit, Mark Sanders in signing Amendment Number 5 would have to admit that he purposely violated his permit and that he was responsible for fines from the time of the original permit until the signing of Amendment Number 5. Who would sign an amendment admitting that they purposely violated their permit and agreed to fines when they did not agree with either? You wouldn't and neither would he. Amendment number five shows you that BCDC agreed the original permit was poorly worded and that a corrected permit could be written that resolved almost Thank all you. the issues before you. Thank you for your time. Michelle Bonoff to be okay. followed by Gordon Ruwa. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I was on the website looking at some of the allegations, and one of the ones that came to mind was the allegation that BC posted that West Point Harbor has failed to create a roosting habitat according to their permit. The permit states that the recreation of the three acres of roosting habitat was no responsibility of West Point Harbor. It was the responsibility of Cargill, which has 15 years ago created this roosting habitat. And in fact, it's now 20 to 30 acres versus the original three acres required. I went to the site the other day and I took a picture and you can see hundreds if not thousands of birds on this roosting habitat. But someone at the BCD has submitted a violation saying that that, that roosting habitat is not in place. Who went down there with their due diligence and could not see hundreds, maybe thousands of birds on a habitat and then make a violation in a fine. Thank you. Good question. David Hattery, or Gordon Mubat, followed by David Hattery. Uh, this is Gordon Mubat, and my topic's already been covered, so I'll cede the time. Thank you. Uh, David Hattery, be followed by Brenda Hattery. CDO allegation 11A, unauthorized construction of rower stock, unauthorized spill, and substantial change in use. Just judging this on face value against BCDC objectives should be enough for this allegation to be thrown out. But at seeking facts, look no further than the rower stock and the original approved BCDC permit. And while approving that permit, BCDC even tasked Mark with the best effort commitment to meet community needs for a boathouse and rowing center for all ages and abilities open to a diverse group of the rowing and boating community. In fact, BCDC wanted the rowing dock and its building moved from the boatyard side to the retail side of the marina, and this new upfront and center location can only be seen as BCDC demonstrating their commitment to its use. After reviewing stacks of BCDC paperwork, at best I conclude the problem is a failure of BCDC staff to follow their own published processes and poor to non-existent record keeping by staff. I have seen BCDC documents approving the change, the DRB review and authorization of constructions, the so BC, thank you. BCDC checklist signatures and dates. Well done. David Hattery followed by Brenda Hattery. I could pick up where I left off, okay. but I won't. My name is Brenda Hattery and I come <laughs> to you with a background in federal regulation of the railroad industry, which is a very difficult industry to regulate. People are fighting all the time about everything. Mm -hmm. And I was involved in consensus-based processes there, which was also very interesting. And what I see between BCDC and West Point Harbor are two very different views. It's your job to make two plus two equal more than four or less than four, but whatever each side is telling you probably isn't quite what you should be seeing. It's your responsibility to ensure West Point Harbor's compliance with its permit and that staff complies with its own internal rules. I look carefully at hundreds, if not thousands, of pages of allegations, responses, drawings, permit materials, and I know the harbor well because I keep my boat there. 
And in the records, I saw that staff doubled back and changed decisions, imposed new requirements not in the original permit, and confused or disingenuously stretched the facts. I'm not happy. I am a former government employee. I'm asking you to look at what BCDC is doing with this case very, very carefully. It's huge. There's a lot of material there. It's easy to understand confusion, but it's not okay to just ignore all the facts uh, at all. Thank, Thank you, you very much for your time. Carol Sheets to be followed by Louis Adamo. Former First Lady Michelle Obama planted a vegetable garden on the grounds of the White House. She started a national dialogue on the benefits of organic vegetables, exercise, and weight loss. West Point Harbor has their own community garden for years. It is run for the, by the voters and is for the benefit of the members of our voting community. The garden does not infringe on any of the walking paths of the, for the public and does not block any public views. The members do not use pesticides and they create their own mulch and grow delicious organic vegetables on the levee between the marina and adjacent Bittern Pond. There is no economic benefit to Mark Sanders, and this garden is simply an amenity for the voting public. BCDC enforcement, the executive director, and this enforcement committee has determined that this is a violation of West Point Harbor's permit and fined West Point Harbor for the garden. Where are the BCDC rules that say it is against organic vegetable gardens? I urge you to take a closer look at these ridiculous allegations. It's your responsibility to oversee these people, and they're not doing their job. I know that Thank they work you. hard. I believe that they work hard. But they screwed up, and you need to hold them accountable. It's just not <laughs> Louis Adamo to be followed by Pauline Rujas Sinaris. My name is Louis Adamo. My wife and I have lived aboard a sailboat together in the Bay Area since 1990 and at West Point since 2011. What I would like to point out this morning is the outrageousness of penalties assessed by this committee. At the hearing on November 16th last year, which I attended, this committee made it very clear that there were two parts to their decision. The first had to do with whether or not they would side with their own staff on the validity of their allegations. No surprise how that went. And the second was the penalty assessment. This part was presented almost gleefully. Oh, don't worry, there will be penalties. Followed by a very brief discussion where the committee asked the staff to remind them how much they had spent putting together the allegation report, as if this had any bearing on what the penalties should be. Then, without any reference to any details of anything that had been presented during the hearing, in a very, very matter-of-fact tone, it was stated that even a reduced penalty needed to be more than they had spent. Sounds like mob tactics to me. I don't believe this is in line with the spirit of why this commission was created, and I think it is reprehensible. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Pauline Ruggis Sinaris to be followed by Stephen Estrada. Good afternoon, my name is Pauline Rasnars. A picture is worth a thousand words, and I think a video is probably worth a lot more than that. So I'd like to roll a video, and I would urge all of you to come and visit West Point Harbor, the place we love and we're here to save. Stephen Estrada, I've been an active voter in California since 1977. 
been a part of the Coast Guard Auxiliary and Ducks Unlimited, which is the largest preservation of the wetlands in the country. And I found it to be an honor and a privilege to be in this marina held by a man with such honor and integrity to do his best to maintain the integrity of the land and the public access around him. No matter how hard your staff works, if they don't know what they're doing, it doesn't matter how they work. They're giving fines against things they can't even enforce. Uh, to have somebody put in buoys that they're not authorized to enforce them to put in, they don't even know what they're enforcing. So a big look needs to be done on what's being enforced, why it's being enforced, and whose benefit it is. This is just a money grab. The arbitrary fine amounts, the arbitrary times, the arbitrary uh, things that you come up with as a uh, as something that they're doing against the public access is a ridiculous uh, thing. Mark's doing nothing but try to attempt to make it a place for everybody to enjoy. He's bringing revenue to the city and to the county and access. You guys need to wake up. Thank you. Dean Hyatt. Hello. I came here today to point out that the revised cease and desist order in front of you has changes throughout that are not highlighted for you to review, nor were they called out to West Point Harbor. This is standard operating procedure for your organization and part of a culture that the commissioners need to change, if only to protect BCDC's true purpose and mission. The only real solution to this issue with West Point Harbor is for the commission to appoint a qualified, neutral third party to review the facts of this case. Thank you. Dean Hyatt to be followed by Whitney Newton. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Dean Hyatt. I understand that DCDC has brought a parking allegation against West Point Harbor, alleging that West Point Harbor did not provide proper parking spaces with the right signage for public parking. Public parking spaces with painted signs, just like the hundreds of public parking spaces at neighbouring Pacific Shores, are made available according to the approved phase design plan. This allegation from August 2008 is incorrect as there was only a dirt road at the time and the design phase not yet complete. Once completed, the 12 public parking spaces were provided with signage. I also understand that the signage on the ground is not approved. Why has Pacific Shores not been fined yet for the same signage? Please also note that putting a sign on a post goes against the Fish and Wildlife Agency, as the top of these posts provide a roosting place for prey that could endanger the natural wildlife of West Point Harbor. I urge you to take a close look and read all the facts before casting your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Followed by David at 101 Sports. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I am a boat owner and have been involved in the marine industry in Europe, Asia, and the US since I graduated from Cal in 1958. I have never seen a marine operation that is environmentally concerned as West Point Harbor. It should be shown and exhibited as how things should be and I would ask that if you have not actually physically been to West Point Harbor and see what a beautiful place and what a great job Mark Sanders and his staff have been doing, please do so. Thank you very much. Hi, David, 101 Sports. I'm going to have David Hyatt. Thank you again for your time. Yes, I'm David Wells, one of the owners of 101 Surf Sports. Um, we operate a kayak and paddleboard rental business on the unauthorized dock. Um, we have made our life's work sharing San Francisco Bay with the public. It's what drives us every day. Um, and it would be a shame to see that this body couldn't come to agreement with somebody who shares such a common set of goals. I read your mission statement. I know exactly what Mark's trying to do with his life. And what we, we're trying to do is the same thing. So why can't we all get together? I stress the need for an independent third party entity to come between this two because it's gotten personal. And it just needs to get back to facts. And let's try to make uh, West Point Harbor um, you know, the crown jewel that it is. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. David Hyatt to be followed by Kenyon Stewart. Uh, 
uh, this is Pauline Lausner's, Dave Hyatt uh, already spoke, um, and Marian Berelich is speaking for Kenyon Stewart. Okay. So, Marilyn, and then Marion Tracy afterwards. Pauline's known me for a while when I was Barrelich. I'm Mary Ann Barrelich Tracy. Um, I, I am a Bay Area native and a Redwood, uh, resident of Redwood City for almost 20 years, and I'm here to talk about the buoys. The process of applying for navigational and no-wake buoys and nautical charts as part of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineering permits was completed in 2009. Uh, BCDC, along with NOAA, USCGC, FWS, DVW, and Port of Redwood City, State Lands, and RWQCD were part of this permit. It was a long process that started in 93, with NOAA being responsible for issuing a permit circulated to all agencies, including BCDC, that was electronically filed in 2002. Permit requirements changed over time, specifically as it relates to no-wake buoys. It was determined that the no-wake buoys are part of Redwood City, which has been maintained at the entrance of the channel. This is all pursuant to the California Harbor and Navigational Code. It was also concluded during this meeting with BCDC participation that no wake buoys cannot be installed beyond the channel entrance as is a navigational hazard. West Point Harbor did install no wake buoys, three miles per hour signs, on the port and starboard pilings inside the entrance to the West Point Harbor. I urge you to take a close look at this and read all the facts before casting your vote. And I want to say it was a paddler out of Bayak um, for seven years before the West Point Harbor was established and it was a toxic hazard as one of our other speakers had said. And now as a resident of Redwood City, I enjoy this newly revived uh, environment and it's a beautiful place to be and I enjoy it all the time as a resident of Redwood City and I would hate for it to go away. Thank you Thank for your you. talk. Jonathan Mars to be followed by Edward Stossel. Jonathan Morris, I work at a local hospital there in Redwood City. Uh, regarding the earlier uh, Scott restaurant matter, um, Commissioner Ranchon said something very wise and poignant, and I appreciated it. And I'm sure everybody here did too. The goal of this commission is to balance considerations in order to be reasonable and comply with regulatory laws. Regarding the matter of safety, the gates and docks and boats are prevented from being locked at this point. The ladies' showers are prevented from being locked at night. And many of us have family, mothers, children, nieces, grandmothers. I have a nine-year-old uh, niece, Olivia, that, uh, with her, her father and mother that stay on my boat occasionally. Um, they shower at night sometimes. They're unable to lock the doors uh, to the bathroom. It's a legitimate safety concern. And this is something that's being prevented. Um, and if these were your family, your daughter, your niece, would, would you change that law? Would you change that rule and allow them to lock the door just to go to the shower, these young women and ladies? Well, I know I, I would if I had that, that choice. So something to consider, and if you could just uh, consider that goal of being uh, balanced and reasonable, I think um, I think doing that, allowing the the, the locks to be uh, the gates to be locked, going to the boats. Sometimes the ladies ladies stay at the boat at night by themselves, and that's something that's to be considered as well for the safety. It's a reasonable matter. And just in conclusion, um, I've been in many harbors. I've had my boats in a number of different places. Mark Sanders and his team runs the best well-run marina I've ever been in. Thank you. Edward Stouse will be followed by Terry Quinlan. It's uh, Edward Stansel, and um, I know West Point Harbor um, from, I've not been a tenant there. Um, I live in other harbors and um, in Redwood City. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but there's been four harbors that have been closed down. Another one's going bye-bye uh, on the 28th of February. Um, Back to Mark's Harbor, um, it's probably the finest harbor I've seen um, uh, on the West Coast. Um, there is, it's thought out completely. There's sewers hook up for each place. You don't have to take your boat around to pump out. You can just hook it up and pump it out right there. It's a lot of thought went into it, and he's being fined for for stuff. I'm thinking the compassionate thing to do would be to go ahead and work a deal, $100,000, let's get you past this, get going, give them a clean slate, start over, and you have some more battles. Thank you. 
Thank you. Terry <laughs> Quinlan to be followed by Nicole Sasaki. Thank you for having us. Um, I am here. My, I'm Terry Quinlan, and I work for uh, worked for many nonprofits in the Bay Area, helping to serve the Bay Area community. This is Allison and Ashley. They are my uh, community members from West Point Harbor. They're helping me out today. It's been curious to me that BCDC does not conduct talks on boating and the environment in the South Bay and elsewhere. The Coast Guard, also an enforcement agency, holds boat safety checks and boating classes and offers this for free and low cost. They make it known that they are a helpful entity, yes, with their rules, yet they are also there to educate and provide information for safe boating. I wondered why the same type of presence, or I wonder why, sorry, the same type of presence from agencies such as BCDC is not in place to help boaters be responsible stewards of the bay. Not only are there important environmental issues of wildlife preservation, which boaters, by the way, care deeply about, there is the important issue of rising seas. Just as NASA has engaged regular people as citizen scientists, and as it has done, been done in the Chesapeake Bay to learn about dolphin life, would it not be better to develop relationships with boaters rather than trying to eliminate any and all boating in the South Bay? Wouldn't BCDC want to encourage engagement of those of us who love the Bay and love being all in the water to help gather useful information that may impact the fate of us all in our Bay? You may say that BCDC does not conduct educational offerings and that you represent an enforcement arm. Yet we all know that the difference in policing, for example, between the by the book officer who is only there to write up tickets so, you. and make arrests, and the benevolent enforcer who cares about the general mood and atmosphere of the town, who cares about the children, the men, and the women. Excuse me, just one more minute. I have one more or two more sentences. Might it not be a more productive relationship with the voters to engage them? To quote a famous early leader of the environmental movement, an innovative and enthusiastic voter and lover of the sea, Jack Cousteau, the sea, the great unifier, is man's only hope. Now as never before, the old phrase has a literal meaning, we are all in the same boat. Thank you. <laughs> Nicole Sasaki to be followed by Peggy Round Linda. Good afternoon, commissioners. I'm Nicole Sasaki, associate attorney with San Francisco Baykeeper. Baykeeper supports the cease and desist order and civil penalty order against uh, West Point Harbor. In accordance with the Megatier Petras Act, BCDC originally granted this permit on the basis that the project would provide the maximum feasible public access to the bay because of the permit's <coughs> public access requirements and would also result in the protection of bay resources, including the habitat at Greco Island and the Redwood City salt ponds, because of the permit's special conditions required habitat production and mitigation. These requirements must be complied with. Uh, Baykeeper appreciates BCDC's action to protect the sensitive habitat in the South Bay and restore public access in full. Thank you. Thank you. Peggy Wellwind, yeah, to be followed by, sorry, Fernanda Castello. Yeah, my name is Peggy Wellwind. I have a boat at West Point Harbor. I began sailing in 1968, and I'm a Bay Area resident. I'm also an educator. I need to let you know that I am in favor of a third party neutral. Uh, decider in this fact because I'm sorry, but the facts are BCDC is being disingenuous with you as a committee. Um, from the beginning of this project, the project had three phases of development. Brad McCray knows this. He sat in meetings where it was discussed. He knows that from the beginning, public ac access would be phased in in phase two and phase three. The phasing of the project was talked about in the design review committee. It was in the original information provided to the commission before the staff, note, before the staff inserted a different plan by switching the drawings. It was not a secret that the public access would be phased in, yet when you read the cease and desist order, you think that BCDC staff is being personally attacked, surprised, appalled, and genuinely served unjustly. In actuality, I go back to the sentence, it was in the original information provided to the commission before the staff inserted a different plan by switching the drawings. Okay, so please take a look. Please consider a neutral third party. Thank you. Thank you. To be followed by Paula Vasinovich. 
Good afternoon. Um, Westport and Harbor is strategically placed at a place in the South Bay that is, as a boater and a sailor, it's the last landmark we see, and as we are coming into the harbor, it's the first one to see. So for boaters and sailors like myself, that is safetyness. This has been a process and a dream of Mr. Mark Sanders in the last 20 years. And he brought these ideas of design, sanctuary, and environmentally, and sustainability from a boater's perspective, not from one person's vision, but to benefit the thriving community that has sprouted and sustained in the inner harbor, including Stanford Boathouse, Bear Islands Rowing House, Sequoia Yacht Club, Peninsula Youth Sailing Foundation, and also headquarters of Northern California, of California Inclusive Sailing, which is on a part of. Think about that. We only have a short time in this life, but we must continue the vision that is in, always in a work in progress. And I encourage the policy head and institution in this room that we look <coughs> at the future by beginning to understand the perspectives of the end users constantly. And if it wasn't for Mark Sanders, this model is slowly reaching out to other ports all over the world because I make it, and I make it my mission when I do travel in different marinas, what we have here in Redwood City. Thank you very Thank much. You. Paul Basinovich to be followed by uh, Captain Amy Defos. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Paula Basinovich, and basically I've been retired from a small company you may have heard of called Apple. I worked there for 33 years in a variety of marketing capacities, and I'm pretty darn well versed in the areas of compliance and negotiation. And the only reason I raise this is because when I look at the reality versus what's been posted on websites as far as infractions, I have to raise my eyebrows in utter confusion. For example, there's been a lot of chatter in here about uh, lack of public access and that this is a private facility. We birthed our boat there and I can say it's anything but. West Point Harbor has docks and facilities open for public access. And they actually have a thousand feet of open visiting berthing, I know because my friends have used it. Um, another thing that has been a bit of a puzzlement for me is um, there haven't been like public access paths. Well, I can tell you there is a heck of a lot of people pub, uh, trotting around paths that aren't public access. In fact, um, I'm thinking of being a consultant for some of these uh, companies over in the uh, Pacific Shores complex based on all the so, chatter I hear from their engineers and legal attorneys. So, so anyways, there's a lot of people floating around and there's a lot of public access and I thank you, Mark, for allowing us to store our boat in your wonderful, pristine, clean, and environmentally friendly facility. Captain um, AMC. I see it. She had a delivery she had to go out on. All right. David Laird. <clears throat> to be followed by Lisa Belenke. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> members of the Enforcement Committee, my name is David Laird. I'm a diver. I clean uh, hulls of yachts underwater. I started at West Point when there were just three boats there, and one of my clients moved there from another marina. It's, it's undoubtedly the nicest marina that I've ever uh, worked in or uh, been around. And, uh, Mark's created a real beautiful community. Um, I want to just share one example um, of uh, what, what it, mirroring what everyone else is mentioning, some strange little contradictions. Um, West Point Harbor is a certified clean marina. That means that the best management practices are followed. Part of those practices are planning and preparation for a fuel spill in the marina. There's a tough shed with fuel absorbent booms and diapers to clean up any spills and it's behind the garbage dumpsters on the site. BCDC enforcement, the executive director and this committee have decided that the boom shed is illegal and must be removed. California says such sheds less than 120 square feet, which it is, do not require permits. This is another example of the $30,000 fines um, and that are total injustice. Uh, members of the enforcement committee are charged with enforcing the intent of the law on permittees as well as the agency itself has clearly failed as the staff violates its own Bill of Rights and procedures, I urge you to take a close look before casting your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa Valenti. 
Yes, good afternoon. Lisa Belenke with the Center for Biological Diversity. Um, I want to echo the comments that were made by Baykeeper, our colleagues at Baykeeper. Our interest in this matter is to see that the permit conditions that protect habitat, like Greco Island and the no-wake zone and the other issues as far as perching and some of the trees that were planted, that those are enforced. It's very important to enforce these kinds of permit conditions that were a precondition of the marina being placed there. The, I understand that people locally feel like, oh, the birds seem to be doing really well, but part of the reason is because of the refuge. And the word refuge is very important. This is one of the last best places for a lot of our bird species in this area. And throughout the bay, we have similar problems. People think, oh, there's tons of birds, but really, it's in these very small refuges that are protected, and we must ensure that there are sufficient conditions to protect them. So if these conditions are somehow too difficult to enforce, as in the signage or buoys for the no-wake, we do hope that a solution can be found. But the important piece is that the condition itself is uh, enforced. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Gail Rahi, followed by Sheila Finch. Good afternoon, Gail Robbie. I'm representing um, Citizens Committee to Complete the Refuge. Um, as we stated in our November letter and our oral testimony, BCDC's primary responsibility is safeguarding San Francisco, San Francisco Bay habitats and wildlife. And therefore, it's imperative that measures outlined in the special conditions for the West Point Harbor permit are put in place as soon as possible. We reviewed the um, executive director's revisions to the order and came prepared to state our support for those modifications. Um, but we support your recommendation this afternoon to send the original proposed cease and desist and civil penalty order to the full commission for consideration. Thank you very much for um, all your efforts. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So Sheila Fish to be followed by Barbara Pierce. I want to thank you for hearing my comment. My name is Sheila Finch, and I'm an artist and a painter of over 50 years. I've had my boat at West Point Marina since it opened back in 2008. West Point Marina is a beautiful place with 180 degree views of the South Bay. As I understand it, the trees and landscaping in and around West Point Harbor that I love to paint, by the way, were all part of the original permit process, and they were approved. In fact, the type of trees were specified by the permit and CEQA requirements for those plantings along West Point Harbor, Slough, and the harbor itself. The landscape plan was presented to the commission back in 2003 with all the details mentioned before and approved in 2006 by BCDC. I watched those little young trees that Mark planted. I watched them as they grew up and I painted them. Now, 10 years later, the BCDC desires to remove those trees that were specifically specified and approved in accordance with the permit. So, why did these mandated and approved trees fall out of favor and fall out of the permit so, after 10 you. years? I'm sorry. So your time's up. Okay. Thank you. It doesn't make sense to me. I just want you to consider that these allegations may be okay. put there <laughs> to confuse the commissioners. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Barbara Pierce to be followed by uh, Dane Howard. Thank you very much. My name is Barbara Pierce. I'm a former mayor and council member from Redwood City. I had the opportunity to sit with Mark Sanders on the Bear Island Task Force, which was a multi-agency volunteer task force that was looking at beneficial reuse of dredged materials from the port to be used to restore Bear Island. In his capacity as the owner of West Point Marina, I've always found him to be helpful, supportive of uh, public access, 
wanting to have green marinas and ensure that all of the boaters and people who are on the waterfront support a healthy environment. So I, I speak to you for that. I'm also a rower out of uh, Bear Island Aquatic Center and encourage you to think about the fact that that area is tidal so that the more stuff we put in the narrow um, creekways and passageways, when the water goes down because it is tidal, it makes it more dangerous for users to use that area. I encourage you to think about what the enforcement fines would do and whether you're creating a better um, area out there or whether it's merely penalizing Mr. Sanders. Thank you. Dane Howard, to be followed by um, Mike Dobbin. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the Commission and staff. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Diane Howard. I'm the Vice Mayor of Redwood City. And I first met Mark Sanders back in the 90s when we worked together on a group called Aquaterra. We had abandoned boat and boats and debris in our sloughs and waterways, and we banded together and worked to clean up our waterways for people to enjoy for the future. I found him to be very supportive and passionate and a good steward of our waterways. Jumping to today, Mark continues to be a good steward of our waterways. He is in compliance with all our local Redwood City permits. He stays involved in keeping our waterways clean and safe. And a benefit to Redwood City, he has allowed the uh, stationing of the fire boat and the police boat to be used for emergency services on our waterways. And we're very grateful for that. I'm sad to hear that litigation may be in the future. I'm hoping that maybe a third party could step in and help mitigate these polarizing issues. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mike, go ahead. Uh, my name is Miles Starr. I'm an ex-Yorker from Redwood City. I've known Mark Sanders since the late 90s when he was waiting 12 years for a permit to build this place. Uh, my point is uh, for Mr. Zepitani and the legal team of West Point Harbor is to question uh, whether PCPC has jurisdiction over you. According to Maine versus Thibault in 1990, um, if jurisdiction is challenged, no further proceedings can be allowed. Until proof of due jurisdiction, that includes all fines and amendments made. Thank you. Thank you. And that was our final public speaker. So we come back to the commission. I think we need a motion, a formal motion to um, send it up to the, the full commission to the recommendation. Excuse me, should you close the public hearing? Yes, close the public hearing. Yeah, yeah, let me uh, do that. So uh, I want to thank the members of the public who came here today, took the time out of their day to come <coughs> here for the agendized item. Um, I, I'm going to make the motion to close the public hearing. Nice point. Is all in favor? Aye. Aye. Public hearing is closed. Um, I, I've reviewed the materials for this item and I've heard the uh, comments from staff and also from council. Um, and as the chair, committee chair, indicated earlier on the advice of council and out of an abundance of caution, uh, I support sending the original proposed uh, order from that was considered in November and upon which a public hearing was held uh, be sent to the full commission for its consideration. All right, I'll second that. Yeah, um, but before we have a vote, I just want to add some clarity to. Um, what the committee here can do. Um, there were a lot of people who came up and asked for various remedies um, that you know perhaps you wanted to see. And I want to make it clear that we listen very carefully to each and each and every one of you. But we are, as the enforcement committee, we are a subset of the full commission. And as such, our purview is very very limited. We can make. We have certain authorities and other authorities we don't have. So some of the um, suggestions that were made today, we, even if we wanted to, we can't take advantage of. Um, and we're sitting in the position of having to recommend um, a course of action to the full commission um, based in large part by 
um, and informed by our November meeting. Um, and I just wanted to say at, at that point in time, the way we left it was um, we were hopeful that the parties would reach um, an agreement, and that was one path. And then the other path was if they didn't reach an agreement, the commission had said that we would recommend our November um, decision to the full to the full commission. And so that's kind of where we are right now. Thank you. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Thank you all. So we have one more item. Um, I'm not sure we have time for it. So I think we're just going to return the. Write the governor. Go I haven't even fixed the first amendment. Write your elected officials. Thank you.